che sede del Museo di Etnomedicina. Bye, bye. Um, muy buenos días. Eh, gracias a la organización del Tercer Congreso Mundial de Transdisciplinariedad. Es un uh, honor uh, participar en nombre de la Cátedra UNESCO de la Universidad de Génova y agradecer a la coordinación de la Cátedra UNESCO de la Universidad de Florencia um, y a los organizadores uh, del evento del Tercer Congreso de la Mundial de la Transdisciplinaridad y abrir el día dedicado a India, Indonesia e Italia. Uh, el programa de hoy uh, va a ser realizado gracias a la generosidad del Monasterio de Albañano, un centro de tradición nalso uh, tibetana uh, de autocuración que desciende de la experiencia y de la vida en Italia uh, de la Maganche en Rinpoche, que se encuentra hoy en el uh, lago Maggiore, en el área de Albañano, cerca de B y de Premeno. Um, nuestra cátedra, la Cátedra UNESCO de Antropología de la Salud de Génova, uh, se dedica al conocimiento, al estudio y a la puesta en valor de los sitios de patrimonio mundial uh, identificables como lugares sagrados, lugares de sanación. Uh, pero nace gracias a un extraordinario museo, el Museo de Etnomedicina de la misma universidad, fundado por un médico, Antonio Scarpa, quien recorrió durante décadas todo el mundo buscando remedios, uh, recursos, reconocimientos y expresiones importantes, uh, colectables y transformables en un museo. El creador de ese museo, que se encuentra hoy con nosotros, es el fundador y director de la Cátedra UNESCO de Génova uh, y es Antonio Guerchi, a quien saludamos hoy. Uh, en un encuentro entre uh, el Monasterio de Albañano y la Cátedra UNESCO de la Universidad de Génova, uh, vamos a tener hoy dos especiales uh, clases magistrales. La primera de Antonio Guerci, dedicada al Museo Scarpa uh, de Etnomedicina y al proyecto de la Cátedra UNESCO de Antropología de la Salud que estamos realizando en Albañano. Mientras que Lama Michel Rinpoche, actual director del Albañano Healing and Meditation Center de Albañano, es decir, el centro de meditación y de autocuración de Albañano, nos hablará de la tradición nalso, de su historia, de cómo nació y de cómo se está desarrollando ahora. Después tendremos una mesa redonda en la cual los investigadores de la Cátedra UNESCO um, y el grupo de investigadores que uh, pertenecen a nuestro proyecto, que vienen también de otras universidades y de otras instituciones, um, hablarán un poco acerca de cómo trabajar interdisciplinariamente para, para poner en valor con un idioma occidental y según una metodología científica, uh, un mundo que indudablemente es capaz de ofrecer una extraordinaria herencia cultural uh, y un patrimonio extraordinario. Paso entonces la palabra al profesor Antonio Guerci, director de la Cátedra UNESCO de la Universidad de Génova. Y antes vamos a poner un pequeño video que cuenta la historia del museo. Mil gracias. Siamo davanti a questa palazzina che è sede del Museo di Etnomedicina dell'Università di Genova, ospitato presso il Dipartimento di Scienze della Formazione, 
e è anche sede della Cattedra Unesco di Antropologia della Salute, Biosfera e Sistemi di Cura. Eh, procediamo ora a una sintetica visita a questo gioiello unico, non solo a Genova, ma direi anche nel panorama museologico internazionale. Siamo all'interno del Museo di Etnomedicina. Il significato della parola etnomedicina è lo studio dei sistemi medici di popolazioni altre, cioè non occidentali. Il museo è dedicato a, a Antonio Scarpa, il quale ha viaggiato per tutto il mondo convivendo e cercando di capire le usanze terapeutiche, diagnostiche, prognostiche di circa 130 etnie eh, dislocate in tutti e cinque i continenti eh, del mondo. Perdon, perdon, non si vede il video, perdon, la, perdon. La sua curiosità lo ha portato a viaggiare per 55 anni della sua vita e raccogliere testimonianze di queste abitudini terapeutiche, alcune curiose, altre meno curiose, ma che in ogni caso possiamo considerarle come un patrimonio della cultura internazionale. Antonio, non si vede il video, non si vede. Poco più di oggetti, la maggior parte delle quali sono qui esposti, Antonio Scarpa ha, ha raccolto... Dina, Adin, non si vede il video. Sì. Noi riusciamo a vederlo bene. Proviamo a rilanciarlo. Qui è tutto nero. È tutto nero. Proviamo a rilanciarlo, magari. Prova. Sì. Un momento. Eh. Siamo davanti a questa palazzina che è sede del Museo di Etnomedicina dell'Università di Genova, ospitato presso il Dipartimento di Scienze della Formazione e è anche sede della Cattedra Unesco di Antropologia della Salute, Biosfera e Sistemi di Cura. Eh, procediamo ora a una sintetica visita a questo gioiello unico non solo a Genova, ma direi anche nel panorama museologico internazionale. Siamo all'interno del Museo di Etnomedicina. Il significato della parola etnomedicina è lo studio dei sistemi medici di popolazioni altre, cioè non occidentali. Il museo è dedicato a, a Antonio Scarpa, convivendo e cercando di capire le usanze terapeutiche, diagnostiche, prognostiche di circa 130 etnie eh, dislocate in tutti e cinque i continenti del mondo. La sua curiosità lo ha portato a viaggiare per 55 anni della sua vita e raccogliere testimonianze di queste abitudini terapeutiche, 
alcune curiose, altre meno curiose, ma che in ogni caso possiamo considerarle come un patrimonio della cultura internazionale. Oltre che 2000 e poco più di oggetti, la maggior parte delle quali sono qui esposti, Antonio Scarpa ha, ha raccolto oh, film, materiale iconografico, materiale librario, volumi di medicine tradizionali che eh, nelle lingue eh, locali. Eh, L'impostazione che ho voluto dare a questo museo per, al fine di meglio entrare in questi particolarissimi sistemi medici è quello che io ho chiamato lo sguardo o la visione antropologica, ovvero una uh, conoscenza dell'uomo nel suo ambiente, nella sua cultura, nelle sue abitudini, altrimenti eh, avremo un'impressione, a mio avviso, errata della visita al museo e dell'osservazione degli oggetti. Sembrerebbe quasi una esposizione di oggetti esotici e non coglieremo il significato profondo che invece cioè, questi oggetti hanno all'interno della loro cultura. Mi sembra importante sottolineare un concetto fondamentale all'interno dell'antropologia della salute e della malattia, disciplina che si avvicina all'etnomedicina, eh, parlare del processo di antropopoiesi. Cosa significa? È quel processo di plasmazione, diciamo così, dell'individuo dalla sua nascita fino, fino all'adultità e alla senilità, di creazione eh, dell'individuo affinché sia consono per quella società specifica, quindi che sia adeguato e questa preparazione parte dalla nascita, dopo la fase evidentemente biologica, evidentemente biologica della nascita, assistiamo al livello del nostro nel genere uomo, assistiamo a un processo di esogestazione, cioè di gestazione esterna, in cui la cultura ha a voce in capitolo molto molto importante, e, e quindi si creano, come dicevo, individui atti idonei all'interno di quella cultura. A questo punto, a poco a poco, iniziamo a comprendere quali sono i vari sistemi di cura che emergono da una lunga preparazione neonatale, anche, anche adolescenziale, fino, fino all'individuo adulto. L'importante è che l'individuo sappia qual è la sua posizione all'interno della sua società e della sua cultura, per conoscere quelli che sono i suoi momenti di crisi, come noi diciamo, di crisi maggiori o di crisi minori, ovvero di disturbi, di malattie che possono essere tra virgolette, curate a livello familiare, in quanto sono dei piccoli, piccolissimi disturbi, per lo più passeggeri, da quelli che sono invece i, le crisi maggiori o i disturbi che invece richiamano in Occidente quello che noi chiamiamo il medico, lo specialista, e presso altre culture invece si rivolgono in questi frangenti al tradi praticien, all'erbolario, al medicine man, al pulsero, allo sciamano, allo stregone. Ogni cultura ha i suoi responsabili di gestione della, della salute. Quindi ogni sistema medico prevede, prevede una scuola, una scuola terapeutica, le più famose, le più note, di cui conosciamo anche nei dettagli, sicuramente è il sistema della medicina ayurvedica, antichissimo, dell'India, il sistema delle medicine tradizionali cinesi, così come quelle di altri piccoli gruppi, ma per la maggior parte sono sistemi uh, poco noti e che Scarpa è riuscito quindi a documentare nel loro insieme. 
quindi delle scuole terapeutiche che si allontanano ovviamente da quelle che sono le scuole di medicina dell'Occidente, basti dire che all'interno della scuola ayurvedica e della scuola delle medicine cinesi il medico deve imparare oltre alle fisiologie, alle patologie, alle nasografie, eccetera, eccetera, anche la musica, anche la musica. Quindi già questo ci dice eh, quanta distanza ci sia tra il nostro sistema medico e gli altri. Ovviamente poi da queste scuole terapeutiche escono i terapeuti che, come dicevo prima, prendono i nomi più svariati a seconda delle eh, località e aree geografico-culturali che in definitiva potremmo dire eh, hanno il compito e il dovere di alleviare quelle che sono le sofferenze umane. Diciamo che in definitiva è questo un po' Il loro, il loro compito. Eh, tutto questo conduce ai mondi e ai modi della cura, ovviamente molto molto distanti da quello che è la medicina occidentale. Tra i numerosi oggetti preziosi del museo eh, mi piace eh, qui evidenziare la presenza della collezione completa delle maschere Sannia, i cosiddetti Yak Sannia, una collezione di 18 entità spirituali che connotano, che caratterizzano la medicina indiana, la medicina ayurvedica e anche dell'area balinese. Sono delle entità che causano delle, dei disturbi, noi diremo delle malattie, che sono evidenziate nella, nelle didascalie che accompagnano tutti gli oggetti qui presenti, ma eh, lo stesso spirito maligno che causa quel disturbo può diventare spirito benigno in quanto capace di guarirci da quella malattia se adeguatamente osannato, se adeguatamente rispettato. Io ho avuto la grande fortuna, piacere, soprattutto onore di essere stato il primo e unico allievo del professor Scarpa. Con lui siamo andati alcune missioni, le ultime della sua lunga, lunga esistenza, e però mi piace sottolineare che alcune delle sue ricerche sono risultate poi fondamentali all'interno della storia dell'etnomedicina. Basta ricordare, tanto per chiarire un po' quanto lui ha fatto, il titolo del testo fondamentale Etnomedicina, il cui sottotitolo era Strane credenze, singolari abitudini meritevoli di approfondimenti scientifici. Ecco, questo è un po' il leitmotiv di quello che è stata tutta la sua indagine, tutto il suo percorso all'interno dell'etnomedicina. In questa cartografia sono presenti i punti rossi in cui Scalpa si è recato, più volte si è fermato a lungo per effettuare delle ricerche o per promuoverle e quindi ritornare dopo un certo periodo di tempo per vedere a che punto erano giunte queste osservazioni da parte dei collaboratori locali. Dicevo numerosissime sono le ricerche inedite di Scarpa. La prima, la prima che risale alla fine degli anni 40 del secolo scorso, inizio 1950, furono quelle eh, per cui lo, lo assursero diciamo, nel gota della ricerca scientifica, fu quello sulla lactazio a gravidica precedentemente chiamata lactatio serotina, ovvero allattamento alla serra della vita, in quanto osservato solo su donne anziane. 
da scarpa invece chiamato definitivamente lactatio a gravidico, ovvero indipendente dalla gravidanza. Cosa vuol dire? Vuol dire che allora quando purtroppo una madre eh, dando la luce il piccolo o la piccola moriva, eh, il villaggio, la comunità di appartenenza creava una balia che non sempre era la donna più anziana del villaggio in quanto svincolata da numerose attività domestiche, ma poteva essere una donna che aveva avuto l'ultima gravidanza anni e anni prima, oppure Scarpa documentò anche donne non lipare che si offrivano per un certo periodo di tempo, che a volte durava anche due anni, per allattare il o la piccola attraverso tutta una serie di preparazioni, attaccare immediatamente il piccolo al seno della balia che si era offerta per ricreare il, eh, lo stimolo capezzolo ipofisario, massaggi ai seni per creare iperemia e quindi schiusura dei tutti galattofori e imponenti bevute di pozioni a base di piante galattogene, eh, bevute che duravano nel corso del tempo. Tra l'altro noi abbiamo raccolto una sessantina di piante galattogene che ci vennero richieste poi a livello dell'Organizzazione Mondiale della Sanità per vedere cosa, cosa vi era di strano. In queste, in queste piante misero in evidenza la presenza di fitoormoni precursori della prolattina. Qui abbiamo anche eh, alcuni documenti di viaggio di scarpa, un taccuino, uno dei tanti taccuini dove lui annotava le sue osservazioni, la sua una delle sue valigie di metallo che si trascinava e si trasportava per tutti i paesi che lui ha visitato, più alcune dediche che io mi sono sentito in obbligo, in dovere di rivolgere al, al mio maestro. Qui siamo nella seconda sezione del museo, quella più etnofarmacologica. Prima eravamo nella sede dell'etnomedicina, qui siamo più nella fase applicativa di questa disciplina, quindi etnofarmacologia. La disposizione è per aree geografico-culturali, quindi dalla medicina indiana a quella cinese, a quelle africane, nord e subsahariane, del sud-est asiatico, dell'Oceania, dell'America Latina. Alcune vetrine invece sono tematiche dove contengono preziose testimonianze, per esempio gli ex voto anatomici o per esempio alcuni pannelli dedicati a particolari rituali terapeutici in alcune eh, popolazioni, purtroppo, purtroppo oggi in via di scomparsa. Voilà, vous avez vu le petit film dédié au musée d'ethnomédecine. Et maintenant, avec l'aide de Adine, on va présenter une registration que je viens de faire autour de anthropologie, santé, transdisciplinarité. Parce que je trouve que l'anthropologie, c'est la discipline par excellence qui pratique, qui fait, qui enseigne la transdisciplinarité. Avec la santé, bien sûr, l'ethnomédecine, et, et vous verrez certaines observations que je considère très importantes autour de ces thématiques. Si Adine peut faire partir... La deuxième partie. Euh, 
Sí, muchísimas gracias, Antonio. Estamos listos ahora para arrancar con la presentación de la segunda filmación del profesor Antonio Guerchi. Gracias. Uh -huh. Sí. Je pense que bientôt va, vont partir les images. Et il s'agit de 20 minutes, 25 minutes de considération toujours autour du problème de la transdisciplinarité. Buongiorno, buongiorno, bonjour à tous et bienvenue à cette séance du troisième congrès international sur la transdisciplinarité. Euh, C'est la chaire UNESCO d'anthropologie de la santé, biosphère et système de soins qui gère cette séance. Anthropologie, santé, transdisciplinarité, comme vous voyez dans le dans les titres. Pourquoi Parce que je pense que une approche à la transdisciplinarité devait passer par l'anthropologie. L'anthropologie. En effet, en effet, je rêve, disait Monsieur Martini, doyen des anthropologues. Français, il y a 60 ans, je rêve d'un monde où il y aurait un anthropologue dans chaque hôpital et un médecin dans chaque laboratoire de sciences humaines. Disons que je se déligne, il y a vraiment l'essence la, la, de la transdisciplinarité. Et bien sûr, l'anthropologie, qui est la discipline que depuis 45 ans que j'enseigne, l'anthropologie est la plus biologique parmi les sciences humaines et la plus humaniste parmi les sciences biologiques. Et disons que plus qu'une discipline, je crois qu'il s'agit d'une façon de penser et de regarder, de regarder le monde, les milieux, l'homme. Donc, la plus biologique parmi les sciences humaines, plus humaniste parmi les sciences biologiques. Humaniste, humanisme, le véritable humanisme, il faut bien, bien le savoir, ne consiste point en une vaine résurgence d'un passé littéraire qui n'aurait pour but que de fleurir et d'enchanter les esprits. Non, ce n'est pas ça. Qui dit humanisme dit utilité pour l'homme de retenir tous les trésors de connaissances qui se rapportent à lui. Il y a une stratification de l'histoire qui condense l'effort de multiples générations et qui vaut pour un savoir plusieurs fois millénaire. On a tout dit depuis longtemps sur l'importance des progrès techniques et sur l'absence des progrès moraux de l'humanité. Mais attention, je crois que cette carence tient peut-être plus à un manque de conscience collective qu'à la moralité générale. Approche transdisciplinaire, bien sûr pour l'étude de, de l'homme, du homo sapiens, de ses manifestations, de sa pensée, il faut 
une approche bioculturelle. Et se trouve où cette interface bioculturelle Alors, il faut connaître avant tout les données du milieu, les données du milieu où vit l'individu ou la population, dans quelle ambiance, froid, chaud, humide, du désert, de la forêt, de la ville, de la grande ville, du petit pays, etc. Les données biologiques, il faut voir comme euh, certains paramètres biologiques sont dus à la pathologie ou à l'adaptation au milieu. Il faut faire attention, ce n'est pas toujours pathologique, euh, des petites différences par rapport à la normalité, mais souvent c'est l'effet de l'adaptation à un certain milieu. Et en plus, il y a les données socioculturelles. Comme est gérée la société Et Ça aussi, il faut savoir pour trouver cette interface bioculturelle. Mais tout ça, sans les paramètres temps, aurait peu de signification. Il faut voir dans le sens diachronique pas seulement synchronique, qu'on va étudier une population maintenant, à l'heure actuelle. Non, non. Il faut voir comme elle était, comme elle est, et peut-être envisager comme elle, comme elle sera. Et attention, je crois que l'étude de la santé et des maladies se prête très, très bien pour comprendre l'importance de la transdisciplinarité, le déterminant bi non biologique des maladies. Les principaux déterminants de la santé ne dépendent pas du système sanitaire. Les conditions dans lesquelles les personnes naissent, grandissent, vivent, travaillent, vieillissent, sont responsables de la plus grande partie des inégalités des états de santé que nous rencontrons. Et alors, anthropologie, anthropologie de la santé ou ethnomédecine et ethnopharmacologie, c'est-à-dire comme il y a une médecine et une pharmacologie en Occident, dans le contexte mondial, il y a une ethnomédecine, c'est-à-dire l'étude des systèmes médicaux différents groupes, différents peuples du monde et une ethnopharmacologie. Nous savons que depuis toujours, l'homme, pour se soigner, a puisé ses remèdes dans son environnement en adoptant différentes stratégies thérapeutiques en fonction de quoi Des caractéristiques climatiques, pédologiques, phytogéographiques, faunistiques, etc. etc. Mais, mais, il ne faut pas oublier, mais aussi en fonction de sa propre culture et de ses propres structures sociales. Donc, cette approche complète. Et, par exemple, savoir comment on est passé du rituel de l'acte thérapeutique typique de toutes les populations du monde, comme on dit les moins évolués et les plus évolués, même si les moins évolués en sens. Euh, tout à fait particulier, comme on est passé du rituel de l'acte thérapeutique à la molécule, à travers des passages de transdisciplinarité continue. Et voilà, voilà le, comme l'Organisation mondiale de la santé, depuis 1978, avait programmé les médecines traditionnelles en adoptant des résolutions par l'Assemblée mondiale de la santé. Disons que la, la première approche, comme vous le voyez, a été en 1978, où il y a eu la déclaration de Hartmann Hatta, qui posa les fondements historiques pour la politique officielle du programme médecine traditionnelle. 
Dix ans après, la quatrième Assemblée mondiale sollicite les États membres pour promouvoir des programmes intégrés sur les plantes médicinales. Après déclaration de Chiang Mai, sauver des vies en sauvant des plantes, en reconnaissant la médecine traditionnelle comme élément essentiel de soins. Après l'inventaire des pratiques traditionnelles, après très importante pour nous anthropologues comme pour les médecins sans frontières, par exemple, l'énonciation de la doctrine de la sécurité raisonnable, c'est-à-dire que si un médecin se trouve sur le terrain, mais il n'a pas avec lui le remède de la médecine occidentale, elle peut, avec une raisonnable sûreté de ne pas nuire aux malades, c'est-à-dire en restant strictement lié au serment d'Hippocrate, employer les remèdes de la médecine traditionnelle locale. Après, après pour aller transporter dans un centre de santé ou dans un hôpital et intervenir, intervenir avec des des médicaments de la biomédecine. Donc, euh, l'OMS a reconnu la validité des médecines traditionnelles. Après, en 1991, stimuler la coopération entre ceux qui pratiquent la médecine traditionnelle dans le but de réduire les charges pharmaceutiques nationales, c'est-à-dire, est-ce que la médecine occidentale, la médecine moderne, peut avoir des suggestions en observant les médecines traditionnelles, point d'interrogation, bien sûr, désormais, désormais est connu. Donc, consultation de l'OMS sur la méthodologie de recherche et évaluation relative à la médecine traditionnelle et les rôles des médecines traditionnelles en 2003, je me suis arrêté en 2003, les rôles des médecines traditionnelles sur les services de santé primaire sauvegarde du savoir médical traditionnel et des ressources phytothérapeutiques pour un développement soutenable, mais pas seulement pour les pays en voie, comme on dit, de développement, mais aussi pour l'Occident. Ça, c'est très important. Et alors, nous, grâce à notre institution, c'est-à-dire le Musée d'Ethnomédicine, cette perle unique dans les panorama international de, de la muséologie et ce, ce musée ethnomédicine intitulé à Antonio Scar, mon, mon maître, que c'est grâce aussi, je disais, à ce musée que l'UNESCO a, a bien accepté notre candidature il y a sept ans à, comme chair, comme chair. UNESCO. Nous avons fait des travaux euh, sur le terrain euh, pour les produits du règne végétal, minéral, animal en dermatologie, plutôt que des remèdes antidouleurs, euh, toujours dans les trois royaumes de la nature, ou des cardiotoniques aussi. Et nous savons que ces recherches ont conduit, il y a déjà longtemps, à trouver des principes actifs euh, qui maintenant employés dans tous les services sanitaires, hôpitaux, centres de santé du monde occidental, en particulier comme les, les lilas blanches, comme les taxus, l'artémisia, etc., etc., la ginkgo biloba, etc. Mais pour arriver à ça, il y a tout un parcours que je voulais mettre en évidence cette méthodologie en ethnopharmacologie qu'on a produite au sein de la Société européenne d'ethnopharmacologie pour démontrer comme hum, vraiment on entre en plein dans la transdisciplinarité. On approche pas, on fait pas ces études si on fait pas de la transdisciplinarité. Et si on voit dans la colonne à droite tous les acteurs qui interviennent. Compréhension des systèmes de santé, anthropologue. Recensement des emplois thérapeutiques, l'ethnomédecin. Identification et emploi botanique, les botanistes. 
l'étude et les recherches sur la convergence d'emplois à travers les traditions orales et les médecines savantes, c'est l'historien. Création d'une banque de données, c'est l'informaticien. Évaluation pharmacologique, c'est le galéniste. Ainsi, pour la préparation des extras, selon la tradition, etc., c'est le chimiste, le pharmacologue et le toxicologue. Identification chimique, le chimiste, après le clinicien, les retours de l'information, l'anthropologue, la diffusion dans le territoire de la médecine et après les programmes de développement de ce nouveau, entre guillemets, médicament, et c'est l'économiste. Donc, vous voyez qu'il y a une dizaine de représentants des différentes disciplines qui se réunissent, qui travaillent ensemble, qui font un procès d'osmose de leurs connaissances pour arriver, dans les cas spécifiques de l'éthnopharmacologie, à bien comprendre, à bien comprendre la valeur de certains remèdes. Là aussi, un travail de, de, tout à fait interdisciplinaire. Les plantes magiques, je sais que je parle euh, aussi euh, des, gens qui, des savants qui m'écoutent, qui sont de l'Amérique latine et savent bien que ce que c'est les plantes magiques. Il y en a une vingtaine. J'en ai choisi ici quatre. Il tricotier Spachanoi, San Pedro, la Yahuasca, la Manite, Muscaria, la Wilka, que bien sûr, les habitants de l'Amérique latine connaissent bien, les principes actifs respectifs, c'est la mescaline, l'armaline, muscaline et la bufotenine. Eh bien, ce qui est très, très intéressant, qui a été découvert, est que la, la, la stéréochimie, la, for, la forme, de la molécule, la forme tridimensionnelle de la molécule de la mescaline est pareille à la forme de la molécule de la noradrénaline, de ces neurotransmetteurs que nous avons dans le cerveau. L'armaline, c'est identique à la sérotonine, à la muscarine, à la cétylcholine et la bufotenine à la dopamine. Donc, on explique bien comme l'assimilation la, 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 de cette plantes jouent un rôle important dans ce qu'on appelle l'état de conscience autre et justifie en effet l'emploi auprès de nombreuses populations. Mais, mais considérer les plantes exclusivement en tant que réservoir de molécules biologiquement actives n'est que leur réductionniste. C'est une erreur. Les populations qui vivent encore auprès de la nature attribuent aux plantes des valeurs qui vont bien au-delà de la phytochimie. Rodrigo Camarelle et Jordi Bascomte de l'Université de Zurich ont effectué une recherche sur 3597 plantes médicinales identifiant 12 495 propriétés thérapeutiques associées, et là je souligne, c'est très, très important, associées à 236 langues indigènes, qui sont eux qui nous expliquent et les plantes, et après on identifie les principes actifs. Mais, mais rappelons, que la directrice de l'UNESCO, Audrey Azoulay, a déclaré il y a un an et demi que toutes les deux semaines dans le monde, une langue disparaît. Et alors, diversité biologique et diversité culturelle sont étroitement liées, nous le savons. La perte d'idiome, hein, toutes les semaines, toutes les deux semaines, et des connaissances thérapeutiques à des effets directs sur la perte d'espèces et d'écosystèmes. On perd un langage, on perd de la biodiversité. Vice-versa, Victoria Reyes de l'Université de Californie souligne que la perte de biodiversité a des conséquences négatives sur la diversité culturelle. 
ça, je crois que c'est un aspect où il, faut, il faudrait s'arrêter et en discuter. La culture met en forme de souffrance en élaborant et en légitimant des euh, contenants, c'est-à-dire des modèles de maladies prétendent aussi. Cette fonction est dénommée pathoplastique, c'est-à-dire mise en forme de la pathologie. Alors, pour conclure, et pour rester dans le temps et laisser un peu d'espace aussi à, aux autres et à tous les collaborateurs au sein de la chaire d'anthropologie UNESCO de, de, de Gênes, c'est-à-dire Abin Gavazzi, c'est-à-dire Anna Siri, c'est-à-dire Tania Re, c'est-à-dire Gianni Perotti, qui vraiment nous ont aidé, je dis en particulier à Bin et, et Anna et Anna Siri, qui vraiment nous sont en train de nous aider et que je ne terminerai jamais de les remercier. L'iceberg de la maladie, ce que j'appelais avec ce symbolisme, tout le monde sait qu ce que c'est un iceberg et, et la partie que nous voyons et que nous entre guillemets, nous touchons, nous pouvons toucher, c'est peu de choses par rapport à l'immensité de ce que nous ne voyons pas. Et alors, et alors, nous voyons, les médecins voient, tous les personnels sanitaires qui s'occupent des problèmes, bien sûr, du patient, voient les problèmes physiques les carences physiques. En l'occurrence, les problèmes mentaux. Mais, mais, parfois l'évidence est seulement une petite partie des problèmes, mais pas toujours la plus importante. En effet, en effet, la grande, la vraie vulnérabilité de l'individu regarde les problèmes sociaux, les sociopathies. Et voilà qu'ici s'ouvre tout un spectre de possibilités que seulement, uniquement, une approche transdisciplinaire peut éclaircer. Seulement une approche transdisciplinaire. Et voici quelques images pour conclure de notre musée d'ethnomédecine que je crois vaut la peine de, de, de visiter un jour ou le jour qui sera prêt en ligne, le visiter. C'est un musée unique où M. Scarpa, comme vous voyez, M. Diet de Médicine à Scarpa, mon professeur, c'est lui qui a voyagé pendant 55 ans de sa vie en approchant et en allant vivre auprès de 125 groupes ethniques dans leur milieu et, et à recueillir du matériel pour démontrer comment d'autres populations, d'autres cultures, font de la diagnostic, du pronostic, de la thérapie avec de différentes méthodes par rapport à nous. Je crois que c'est très intéressant de se confronter avec ces systèmes autres, surtout pour avoir ou des idées, on a vu tout à l'heure avec des plantes, qui après, par synthèse, on obtient des molécules qui sont employées en Occident pour, pour les médicaments mais aussi pour connaître leur approche, l'approche mentale, l'approche culturelle vers les corps malades ou les corps sains de l'autre côté. Merci, merci. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Grazie, moltissime grazie, Antonio. Thank you, it was a very beautiful talk. I, I, I really appreciated the part in which you remind us about the vulnerability of ecosystems 
and you remind us that that cultures are endemisms. We are endemisms. So the more we safeguard our our natural diversity and the more we safeguard our cultural diversity, the more we help life to become healthy and therefore us as individuals and communities. Thank you so very much. Um, and now if you allow me, I will pass the floor to uh, Lama Michel Rinpoche. He is uh, the abbot and the chief of uh, the uh, Albaniano Healing Center and Monastery, directly coming from the lineage of Lama Ganchen Rinpoche, uh, born in a, um, a Brazilian and Jewish family of Sao Paulo. Uh, Lama Michel very early had the a fantastic opportunity to meet and learn with under the um, um, teachings of Lam, uh, Lama Ganjan Rinpoche and then attended uh, two monasteries, one in India and one in uh, Tibet. So um, we have now here really the embodiment of what you would call uh, a, a true uh, bi-cognitive scientist of the 21st century, uh, able to speak in a Western language, uh, translating in a current and comprehensive way of a very ancestral and profound knowledge, uh, which is rooted in what we would call uh, transdisciplinary approach, but they would simply call a comprehensive and holistic approach. So in, in, in his life and in his experience, we, we don't just see an example of this, we see a model for the future. So I'm very happy and honored to leave the floor to Lama Michel Rinpoche. Thank you very much. Okay. Buongiorno, buenos dias, good afternoon here in Italy, buenos dias a Mexico. So, uh, I'm first of all, I'm very grateful to be here, to be part of this gathering, and uh, to be able to share with you a little bit from our tradition which is part of our, let's call, human in Denver, in a way. You know? So before entering more into what is um, also Gandhi-Nyingyu lineage, I would like first to make a very short prayer, which I do in every context I go. It doesn't matter if I am in a Congress, or if I am in a school, or if I am in a temple, or anywhere. And uh, in the very beginning, I always like to begin with this very short prayer, in which I remember my own masters, my gurus, my teachers, and the teachers of my teachers. Because I believe gratitude is something very important, and if there is anything that I can share with you today, it's because someone has taught me. So I need to be grateful. So I will make this very short prayer as a sign of gratitude. Okay. The first part of the prayer is in Tibetan, the second part in Sanskrit. Locho sampo pagyo trashipa tuche tempe chinle yarnoda pelge drolor zampe tse parache Pande alame shabla solva de. Oma guru vajra dara sumatimonisha sane karma uta varda nishri badra varsa manya sarva siddhi ahum. Pakyukye kudan dagi lua, pakyukye sundan dagi na, pakyukye tukdan dagi yi, 
Tenyer me chikto chingi alo. Ma kyu ke kudan da gelo. Ma kyu ke sundan da gena. Ma kyu ke tukdan da geyi. Tenyer me chikto chilo. Omo muni muni. Maha Muni Shakya Muni Svoha. Okay, thank you. So Let's start from the beginning. I have had the opportunity in many years, in this short life, to travel quite a lot and to meet people in so many different parts of the world, so many different cultures and religions and levels of education and so and so on. And uh, there is something that it's very strongly common between all of us. And uh, which I see as the main force that guides not only humanity, but every form of life. And this strong force, it's basically the very profound desire for happiness and aversion for suffering. In other words, it doesn't matter who we are, where we come from, from which culture we belong. Each and every one of us, we all want to be happy and nobody wants to suffer. This is part of our basic characteristic as a human. No? So, and uh, everybody can listen well to me in the Zoom. There, you can listen to me? Yes? Okay. Okay. So, okay. So, there is this very profound basic instinct, this basic desire. In Italian, there is a word which is Brahma, which is this, this strong, deep desire, non conceptual attraction for happiness and at the same time, aversion for suffering, which they both comes together. And if we look in the history of humanity, we have been trying every way we can how to reach this state of well-being. What can we do to avoid suffering? What can we do to gain well-being and pleasure and to be well? So this is the basic, how to say, reason for what why each one of us do what we do. This is the basic reason behind every religion, every tradition, every scientific system, or uh, all our political systems or everything else that we may have created as humans. I believe that the reason behind everything is this is strong wish for happiness and aversion for suffering. The difference is that each one of us will look for happiness in a different way. We project it in a different way. So when we take a particular tradition that have developed centuries after centuries, is basically the result of an accumulation of knowledge and experience, which is being passed generation after generation. And that's something which touches me very much to see this incredible ability that we as human beings have to share knowledge and experience. So basically one person can have his or her own experience and understanding. And then this person is able to share this understanding which took a long way to reach the conclusion. He's able to share with someone else. And then this person can receive this understanding and then elaborate it and pass it to someone else still. So on every aspect, it can be scientifically or religiously or any sort of knowledge. 
there is always this passage of knowledge from generation to generation. So when we look at a spiritual tradition, which is in this case inside of Buddhism, for me, it's a process that goes through many generations of techniques, of knowledge, of understanding, looking towards this state of well-being and happiness. This is the ultimate goal in a way or another. Finally, this is the main objective. So when we look particular at this tradition, you know, today I was requested to speak, to introduce the Nalso lineage, the Nalso tradition. And um, every tradition, every spiritual tradition is based on persons. It's based on the knowledge and the experience of people that they were beyond, let's say, most of us. And they were able to have some deeper experience and they could share it in a very special way. So in our case, this person was Drubon Lama Kanchi Rinpoche, who was a very special person. First of all, if I need to describe the qualities of Lama Kanchi Rinpoche, because it's very difficult to talk about the Nalso lineage without talking about Lama Ganshi Rinpoche. It's almost impossible, basically. So Lama Ganshi Rinpoche has been a person, not only a master within Buddhist tradition that have learned all the part of Buddhist philosophy and healing methods and dedicated his life as a healer, as a teacher, as a spiritual guide for thousands of people but has been for me one of the main incredible qualities is he has always been a very clear, alive example of what was being taught. Because for me personally, why, when I start to follow Buddhism and enter into it, I was not really into Buddhism. I was very small. I really didn't have any idea what Buddhism was about. It was not a matter of choosing a religion or choosing a tradition was the matter of having one person who touched me deeply and who was a clear example of what I wanted to become. So Rinpoche, Lama Ganshi Rinpoche, he always reminded us that the basis of the path that we follow our tradition is, as he said, inner peace is the most solid foundation for world peace, is the development of inner peace. And then all the methods of how to do it and so on, which we will talk a little bit about it. What are the specific characteristics of this tradition? But on the basis of it has been the transmission of a person that has been the embodiment of inner peace, has been the embodiment of love, of kindness, of coherence, of wisdom, of generosity. And this for me is one of the most important aspects. I was reading some days ago one Greek philosopher and one Roman Greek philosopher, which was uh, Epiteto and um, Seneca. And uh, I saw so many incredible ideas and thoughts being shared. But the, one of the great differences which I find is that in Buddhist tradition, we say that when we go to learn anything, we must receive it from someone that have had the experience and that have received that knowledge in an uninterrupted lineage. Which means I receive from someone who have the experience and have received from someone that had the experience. And like this, we need to go on until the first one that taught. And uh, on my own small perception and from what I have seen, a lot of the, for example, knowledge and wisdom that was developed in the western part of the world, for example, in the Greek culture. I would not know really where to look for people that have been practicing the Stoic tradition, one generation after the other in an uninterrupted way, and really realized it and follow it really well, that can share with us. I don't know, I found many things that incredibly similar to Buddhism. But what, was, what is one of the main aspects when we talk about these traditions? That 
the tradition must be alive. And for a tradition to be alive, there are two important aspects, which in Tibetan are called Lungi Chokor and Tokpe Chokor, which we translate as turning the Dharma wheel of the oral transmission and the transmission of realizations. So basically what happens is that the first one means that I learn different concepts in a way that has been taught for many generations. So I will receive different teachings with different methods and uh, different views and so on, which will build my own world view. And that have been taught to me in the same way that they have been taught one generation after the other. This is one part of transmission. The other part, which is fundamentally important is what we call transmission of realization, which means I receive an explanation, I receive a transmission of a system from someone that not only believes in it, but have been putting it into practice in his or her life, possibly that have actually realized it and that have received it from an uninterrupted lineage. This is also an aspect that is incredibly important. So for example, when we go to look for someone to teach us, we don't go to look for someone that only has the knowledge but we need to look for someone that has the knowledge, that has an uninterrupted lineage, and that put into practice what is being taught, that is an example of what is being taught. And this is fundamentally important. And it is said that a tradition is kept alive in the moments that this two transmission happens. And from the transmission of knowledge and experience, not one person receives it, and by receiving it is able to transform his or her own mind and behavior. In the moment that this inner transformation happens, that's what gives life to the tradition. So I'm very proud in a way, very happy to say that the Ngalso tradition is in a tradition that is alive. This one aspect that is very important. I have different people, I am one of them and I have many others that have been receiving knowledge, experience, and uh, have been able to transform one's own life, one's own inner experience, one's own attitude and so on. So this means that this tradition is alive. This is one of the most important things, more important than building big temples or writing incredible books or making many courses or having a lot of material what really keeps the tradition alive is that there are people that by entering in contact with that knowledge and experience are able to transform themselves in a virtuous positive way as we expect. Which means the development of more peace, less anger, more stability, less anxiety, more love and compassion, less selfishness and so on. So this is what it means for the tradition to be alive. So first of all, this tradition is alive. This is one important thing I wanted to share. And this tradition is alive and we have received it through Lama Gansha Rinpoche, that who himself have received from his many masters, that have received from their masters in a tradition that came from Tibet until the 11th century, that arrived in Tibet in the 11th century through one master called Atisha Dipankara, that himself received the tradition in India. And also he received also in Indonesia at the same time, where is Borobudur nowadays. So what defines a tradition in this way? There is basically three aspects, which for me are very important that I wanted to share today with you. There is one part which is called the view, one part which is called conduct, and the third part, which is the techniques or meditation. Because when we say, okay, this is the Ngalso tradition, but what it means being a tradition? What are the aspects that define it different than others? Why Ngalso tradition and not another one? Because Buddhism has so many branches. It is said to be like the same water source coming from the same snow mountain, that as the water goes down melting from the glacier, 
slowly it becomes into many different rivers. These are all the different traditions that comes from the same source. So the source is Buddha Shakyamuni. Then as Buddha Shakyamuni passed away and all his different disciples gathered, at one point they put, they were together and they said, look, excuse me, but Buddha said this to me. And the other said, no, but he said that to me. And uh, it's not fitting exactly well. There is some differences and contradictions. So finally, different traditions were made since the time just after Buddha passed away. And gradually in the next decades and so on, there were originally four traditions in India, which we call in Sanskrit the Vaibhasika, Sautantrika, Chittamatra, Madhyamika. The first one, the Vaibhasika, is divided into 18 different schools. And all of this was originally because Buddha had this particular characteristic of teaching people in accordance to their needs and mentality. So these 18 different schools is not because people didn't agree with each other, but it's because Buddha gave the same teaching in 18 different ways with small differences between them in 18 different places. And it was not because he changed the idea and he was tired and he didn't remember what he said in the other one. These were basically very strongly connected to the monastic vows of discipline. And according to the culture of each place and each people, they had different needs. So he was explaining in different ways. And when Buddha was teaching to a peasant, he was teaching in one way. When he was teaching to a Brahmin, he was teaching in another way. When he was talking to a king, he was teaching in another way. So he was adapting himself to the mentality and capacity of each one. And out of this, different traditions came out. So, one very fundamental aspect of Buddhist tradition, and I believe this is not only in Buddhism, is that also in the Christian tradition, I don't like talking about traditions which I do not represent in a way, but it was not written. It was written later. The Bible was not written by Jesus. In the same way, all the sutras of Buddha were not written by Buddha. They were written around 300 years after Buddha passed away. Until that time, they were all oral transmissions in which people had an incredible memory and they would gather and they will repeat what Buddha had said. So just after Buddha passed away, all the disciples gathered together. They put all one part of their yellow clothes. They put one on top of the other. They made a throne. Each one of the main disciples would sit and they will all start by now, which means one day, so I have heard. I was in this place with this person, Buddha was present, this one made this question and Buddha answered like that. After 300 years, they started to see that the versions were not all the same. The same teaching was being remind, remembered in, by one person in one way, the other one, some small differences. So they gathered again and they put it down into writing. That's where all the sutras came. But I question myself why Buddha chose not to put the teachings in writing. Was it because Buddha was not capable of writing? Was it because at his time there was no material resources to be able to write? Was it because no one was interested in writing? My own understanding, this is my own perception, is that Buddha didn't put his own teachings into writing because also according to the oral lineage past, he said that his teachings should be continued by those that put it into practice, that should adapt it to the needs and capacities of the next generations. Most probably if he would have put everything into writing, we will be still now stuck into what was written that changes meaning after generations. When we take the sutras of Buddha nowadays and we read it, it's so difficult to understand. That's why in Buddhist tradition, we need the commentary of the sutra, the commentary of the commentary. Every few centuries, you need a new commentary because our level of understanding changes. Okay, and this is happening nowadays also. If we take the texts that were written two, 300 years ago, 400 years ago in Tibet, 600 years ago, we cannot understand it really. So we need someone nowadays to translate it again in the same language, but we need to make a commentary about it. And that's what's the beauty of a lineage. One of the main functions 
of a spiritual guide inside the tradition. And one of the most traditional aspects is to adapt the knowledge and the experience to the mentality of those present in his or her time. This is something that is fundamentally important and traditional. Because sometimes we think that tradition means to do the thing exactly in the same way as it was done before. But what tradition means inside the Buddhist experience is that is to adapt the teachings without losing the meaning, without losing, let's say, the quality, but at the same time adapting to the mentality of the people of one's own time. So what Lama Ganshi Rinpoche did was to receive the knowledge, understand it, realize it, comprehend it, realize it, put it into practice, live, let's say by the rules, live by it, apply it to his own life. And then when he came to the Western world in the beginning of the 80s, he found himself in a very different reality than the Tibetan world where he grew up or the Indian culture where he was in the Tibetan community in India and so on. So he stayed for the first 10 years, he committed himself to learn the Western culture before teaching. So basically he dedicated the first 10 years only for healing the body. And there was almost no teaching. He taught very little. He would teach mainly only one mantra. That's why Lama Ganesh Rinpoche at the time was known by some people as the Lama of one mantra only. You know? And then uh, gradually he was doing a lot of healing, teaching very little. After 10 years, he said, okay, I took 10 years to check you guys, Westerners. I wanted to check, one, if it was worth giving you my tradition and sharing, if it was a valid vessel to receive it, a fertile land to plant this seed. And on the other side, I needed to learn your culture. I needed to understand your mentality before I can share. And that's the moment in which Lama Ganesh Rinpoche, in the beginning of the 90s, started to teach what he gave the name of the Ngalso tradition, okay? Which is a very ancient tradition coming from Buddha Shakyamuni, arriving in Tibet through what we call the Gelupa school of Buddhism that Lama Ganshin adapted to our modern needs and capacities, which is called Ngalso. So to understand a little bit about Ngalso, we need to divide it into three parts. There is a part which, which we call the view, which is basically the world view, is the understanding of reality, is the paradigm to which we live. We start from the simple fact that each and every one of us live within our own paradigm. There is no one of us that is capable of experiencing any aspect of reality independently of one's own self. So in the moment that I am talking to you, in the moment that I see you, in the moment that I interact and I understand and perceive anything, inevitably, I will perceive it through my own understanding, experiences, through the culture I have lived, the context in which I have grown up, and all the other aspects that build up my own worldview, my own paradigm. It's like if we have many different filters. So I would say that one of the most important aspects of Buddhism, in this case also inside within the Ngalso lineage, is what we call the view, which basically is in which Buddha shared with us his own worldview, his own paradigm regarding different things. And this was transmitted and adapted up to our daily, uh, days, okay? So when you talk about the paradigm, it starts basically on four questions, which all of us do have answers for it, even though we may not be aware of it. And the four questions are represented by the word ngalso. Ngal literally means tiredness, negative. So literally means to regenerate, to recover. Okay, so means 
to recover from tiredness, to recover from suffering. So the meaning of it is that the first two questions regard to what is suffering? In other words, what do I want to avoid? What do I want to eliminate? And the second question is, why do I suffer? Basically, this is a question that we all answer. Normally, if we say what is suffering, we will all project that our suffering is basically our physical suffering, pain, tiredness, hunger, thirst, heat, cold. And then there is what we call the suffering of mind, in which there is uh, sadness, there is depression, there is fear, there is anxiety, and there are many other forms of mental suffering, okay? So these are the first two aspects. What is suffering? We have physical suffering, and then we have also mental suffering. Most of us normally, when we ask ourselves, why do I suffer? In other words, whenever we experience suffering, we are ready to point our finger towards something or someone as the actual cause of our suffering. This is something very spontaneous that we do. So in our most common view, suffering is basically physical and mental suffering. Sometimes we're not even so aware of having mental suffering, even though most of the suffering that we have is mental. Second, why do we suffer? Most of the times we project our suffering into external causes. I'm suffering because the situation is happening like this, because that person is acting like that, and so and so on. The third question is, what is happiness? And the fourth question, what shall I do in order to eliminate suffering and to be happy? So these are four fundamental questions. What is suffering? What generates suffering? What is happiness? How do I generate suffer, eliminate suffering and generate happiness? This is, it may look quite some, somehow simple questions, basic questions, but this brings us back to our fundamental aspect of the wish to be happy and the wish not to suffer, which is what moves us, what drives us to do everything that we actually do normally in our own lives. So depending on where I project my own suffering and what I project as the causes of happiness and what I project as happiness will change completely my way of life. Will make a tremendous difference. So the common way of seeing it is that suffering is just body and mind suffering. Reason why we suffer because the world is not as we think it should be. The situations do not happen as we think it should happen because people don't behave in the way how we expect them to behave and so on. It's mostly projected as external causes. In the same way, most of us, when we think about happiness, we project our happiness into external conditions. So we project that, okay, I will be happy when this situation will change. I will be happy when that and then will happen. I will be happy when this person will do like this and that person will do like that and so and so on. Very often we project our own state of happiness into an external condition. So as a result, what do we do to gain our own happiness and to avoid our own suffering? We try to create external conditions. So in, our, in, the, in this paradigm, it is said that suffering is not just the suffering of body and mind. As long as we have conflicts within us, inevitably there will be suffering. And uh, there are many things in which we project as happiness, but actually cannot sustain such happiness as it is, and it's called being of the nature of suffering. Now I'm not going to go into details on all of this, otherwise we can stay days here and that's not the purpose. So the basic point is that pleasure is good, but I cannot project pleasure as being happiness. Having material things is good, but I cannot project it as being actual happiness because it cannot sustain it. It's not a sustainable state of well-being. For instance, whenever we have any sort of pleasure, 
There is not one pleasure from the body that I know that the more I have, the better I am. There is not one pleasure like, okay, I'm thirsty, I drink water, it's wonderful. But the more water I drink, it will not sustain the state of well-being and would not make it better. If I drink one liter, two liters, three liters, the more I go on drinking water, what happens to the sensation of pleasure? It goes down until it becomes suffering. And like this is for every pleasure of the senses. Like this is when we gain any material thing or when we gain recognition of our image and so on. And the other point is that there is no place to escape. Sometimes people come to me and say, oh, Lama, can I make, take some vacations from myself? Many people try using alcohol, using drugs, going through extreme stimulation of the senses in many ways, trying to forget one's own thoughts and emotions. But truly doesn't work. I can go very far, but finally I take myself with me. So all my fears, my anxieties, my traumas and everything that I have in with, it, with me, wherever I go, it comes along. So this brings us to the second question, which is why do I suffer? And making it really, really short, trying to make it really simple. We do not suffer because of the external condition, because how things are. We suffer because we relate to the world in a way that is conflictuous. We relate to the world through our own ignorance and selfishness and hatred and jealousy, envy, and so on. So all of this is basically generating this inner experience of suffering. In other words, we are not a victim of the world. Very often we act saying, Okay, I am feeling sad, why? Because this happened, that happened. I'm feeling anxiety because you did this, he did that. So we are victims somehow. So one of the important aspects of this first paradigm is we are not victims of anything and anyone. We experience reality through our own filters. So the objective is not to change the world, but to change the way how we relate to the world. And as a consequence, we will change the world. But the causes of suffering are our own actions, our own habits, but they come from within, not from outside. Okay, we could go on and on for hours here, but I'm not opening that door now. The third point, it is then, is it possible to be happy? What do we mean by happiness? What do we actually want in life? And as Lama Ganshi Rinpoche said many times, he would say, I have only one rule, inner peace. Main thing, inner peace is the most solid foundation for world peace. And the point was, once we have inner peace, it doesn't matter where we go, where, what, in which condition we are, we are able to keep balance of our own self. We are able to experience life in a way that is, pleas that is pleasurable with satisfaction and so on. In other words, if we imagine an object that is in balance, in one edge we put the environment, in another edge we put the body, in the center we put the mind. What happens is that if the environment is unhealthy, normally we go down, we lose the balance and we suffer. If the body is unhealthy, we lose the balance again. But if the environment is unhealthy and the body is unhealthy, but yet the mind is very peaceful and very healthy, it's possible to have a flexibility that allows us to be well, even with these external difficulties and conditions. On the other side, if we are in a very beautiful environment, as many of us are, if we are with a very good health, with nothing missing for us, all our basic needs are more than covered, but our mind is unhealthy and full of conflicts and difficulties, is somehow like experiencing hell while being in heaven. The other way around is also possible. So the main point here is that when we talk about happiness, our objective 
is not to change the world, but is to experience reality in a state of peace, of harmony, of satisfaction, of love, of kindness. So this is one of the most important aspects of how do I internally experience reality, more than actually the external reality being in one way or another, which is what in Buddhism is often called nirvana, which is not an external state to reach, it's an internal experience. And this makes a very big difference in the way how we live our lives, because automatically this will bring us the consequence, which is what do I do to be happy and to avoid suffering? And here comes the whole part of conduct and meditation, okay? Basically, what we need to do is to avoid everything that we recognize that is harmful to us, cultivate what is beneficial to us. And in our conduct, one of the main important things is to avoid acting in, with violence physical violence, verbal violence, mental violence, to cultivate through our daily habits, to cultivate an attitude of respect, of gratitude, of love, of stability, of satisfaction, to relate to reality in a way that is consistent, that is coherent, which we call the development of wisdom. So in essence, we should cultivate love towards ourselves, which is our ability to do what we know is good for us and to avoid what we know is harmful to us. This is basically love towards oneself. Together with it, we need to develop love towards others, which is an altitude of altruism. And the third, to develop what we call a correct view of reality to relate to reality in a consistent way. And this is a very deep and complex subject. I'm not opening it right now here, okay? So in order to be able to do all of that, Lama Ganesh Rinpoche have taught us different also meditation practices in which we use different archetypes, different images, different techniques of breathing, of visualization, in order to help us to generate positive states of mind, to identify ourselves with positive states of mind, in order to gradually familiarize ourselves with it so that we can realize it. I'm trying to make something quite complex, simple, okay? But the important thing is that the final objective here is to be in peace with oneself and others, to experience a state of harmony, not to be in conflict with oneself and others, not to live with anxiety, with fear, with sadness, but instead to be in a state, in, in a position in which we are truly in harmony with love, with gratitude, with respect. This is basically one of the most important things where it all comes together, okay? And what comes together with it, which I think is something very important also, and I would like to conclude going to that direction is our capacity of dreaming. And one of the things that Lama Gan Rinpoche have shared with us was he, were his dreams. Rinpoche had this amazing capacity of dreaming, of looking forward and seeing the best in each one of us and saying, it's possible, go for it. Because one of the most incredible qualities of us, us human beings is our capacity to imagine. Otherwise, we just react to the present moment. But it's imagination that have allowed us to develop the greatest philosophies and the greatest technologies and all of this, it's imagination that has allowed us to do that. It's only through our capacity to imagine something that is not in front of me that actually we can make this process of growing and developing new things. And one of the things that is very important is we must be able to imagine a version of ourselves that we want to become. This is fundamentally important. Like in medicine, 
We talk a lot about sicknesses, about all sorts of disease and cures to the disease and so on. But when I talk to doctors, friends, this morning I had a group of doctors that I was talking with them. And you try to get a definition of health, physical and mental health. Define a healthy person. It's so difficult. People can define most sicknesses but comes and define a healthy person, define a healthy mind. It's quite complex. People have difficult even defining what a mind is, forget about a healthy one. So one of the very important aspects is if I cannot imagine something and if I do not wish and desire for something, I will not go in that direction. So I would say that one of the fundamental aspects in our tradition, but not only, and something that I'd like to share with everyone is we come to the question in our life, not of what we want to do in life, which is okay, it's important. You like to be a doctor, you like to work in one company or whatever you like to do, that's fine. But it becomes more important, not what I want to do, but who do I want to become? Not I want to be the president, no. Do I want to be a person that is in harmony or in conflict? Do I want to be a person that reacts always with anger or with love and kindness? Do I want to be a satisfied person or be constantly unsatisfied? So we make clear, who do I want to become? We allow ourselves to follow a dream, an utopian view of being a perfect being, which, what we, which we call a Buddha. A Buddha basically is someone that was able to develop his or her own inner qualities such as love and wisdom to their maximum potential and consequently eliminate completely ignorance, anger, hatred, miserliness, and so on. So what do we want? Do we want to become that or not? And uh, for me, this is one of the most fundamental aspects. And uh, I had many years in my life in which I was studying Buddhist philosophy in a very traditional academical way and so on, academic way. And there was a moment in which I was in deep and strong crisis. Because I checked and I said, okay, I believe in Buddhism. I see that it's possible. I want, I love the teachings, but I don't believe in the results. I don't believe it's possible to become a Buddha. Come on, if just the first steps are so difficult. So it took me two years, more or less, to elaborate this question a lot and go through it and talk to different of my masters. And uh, what helped me very much to find a conclusion which was positive to it was to be able to see people that were an example of what I want to become and see that actually it is possible and it's not something so far it depends how much energy we put into that direction so if i need to put in very few words i would say that and also tradition it's a combination of worldview behavior which means let's so call in brackets rules of behavior, ways of behavior, ways to talk, to listen, to eat, to interact with people, and so on. Methods to familiarize ourselves with our own inner qualities and methods of healing. In order to develop our qualities to their maximum potential and overcome our own defilements, and by that to reach oneself a state of peace and help others to do the same that were taught by Lama Ganchi Rinpoche based on his own knowledge that he received from his masters and his own experience in a way which we call from heart to heart, which makes this tradition to be alive. And uh, I like very much always to remember one verse from one important master from the 11th century called Atisha. And he said, respect deeply each and every spiritual tradition and follow with determination the one that you prefer. So I don't think the world should be Buddhist. I don't think everyone should follow the same tradition. 
But I request each and every one of you, please do the best that you can to cultivate love and satisfaction and wisdom to be more stable, to be more kind. This is what we need most than anything else. Okay, so uh, this is all that I wanted to share. We could stay hours and hours and hours talking here, but I think with this, I could give some idea about what is this tradition. So thank you very much for everyone. I chose to speak in English today because of the audience and so on, but I would like to say especially because we are connected today especially with Mexico. Muchas gracias a todos. Un grande placer poder estar aquí. Un grande abrazo. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Lama Michelle, your, as usual, enlightened words bring not just knowledge, but truly hope and a very beautiful light, which I see reflected in the sunset on Lake Maggiore right in front of me, but which truly corresponds to the atmosphere we breathe here. And, and one of the comments that really sprung to my mind while, while Lama Michelle was talking is that we don't just learn with the mind, we learn with each part of ourselves. We, we learn and teach with our hearts, with our dreams, with our emotions, and also with our mind. So the fact that we are able to go beyond the single organs and, and become knowledgeable with all parts of ourselves reminds us truly that interdisciplinary is just a word to explain how we truly experience the world as humans and how we do have this ability, we do have it as humans. And, and the beauty of, of Nalso image is that it makes it open and possible to everyone today and shows examples of people like Lama Michel who are succeeding and, and showing this success and sharing this success with all of us. So I, after these words, I am supposed to introduce a little talk about uh, our work in the um, Albaniano Healing and Meditation Center as a UNESCO chair. And um, I would like to very quickly explain that after the two talks of Lama Michelle and Professor Antonio Guerci, we will have a very small round table uh, talking about the integrated research, the transdisciplinary research we activated in Albaniano since as a chair since uh, 2018, and that we also activated in uh, Borobodur, uh, of which we will speak in, um, in our next meeting. Uh, and this research group is grounded around not just the idea of the expansion and the application of NALSO everywhere, in every culture and in every area, but the idea that NALSO heals the environment, the people, society, as, as it did heal and as it was generated in sacred and healing sites. It's not by chance that Albaniano is, is growing on a sacred site, an ancestral sacred site, which we know today as a World Heritage Site, surrounded by a biosphere reserve, um, exactly as we see today in, in Indonesia, in the monumental area, world heritage of, of Barabadur. So healers since the beginning of days had the ability of recognizing within nature, within the natural landscape uh, that organization that made the biotic network of life 
positive to human health. And these were the sites where they established their sacred centers. So this is why we work in Albaniano, because we try to understand why and how Lama Ganchen gave us this place. How was this place populated by what forms of life and how they became throughout centuries and millennia an integrated healing site, which today we call Albaniano. Uh, if the um, presentation is on, maybe we can have, we can see the first slide. Uh, today and Wednesday will be held by um, the beauty of the collection of the Heinz Plank photo archive, uh, whom we thank deeply. Uh, thanks to uh, the opportunity of taking scientific care of the works of this photographer. Uh, we are developing a project, taking his work throughout World Heritage Sites dedicated to healing and to wellness. Um, and so uh, all the pictures that you will see of Albaniano, uh, of Gifa, of the, of the World Heritage Sites, of also Borobudur on, on um, Friday will be uh, thanks to the uh, registration, the photographic registration we are carrying over with photographer and conservationist Heinz Plenge, whom I officially thanks. Um, so the first picture you see here is, is Lama Ganchen looking at, at his dream, essentially, looking at, 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 at the manifestation of a dream, the dream that Lama Ganchen had of, of a lake of five mountains, of, of an area where, uh, where harmony was was possible, was visible, and it could be translated into a practice that each and everyone would follow. And this is how Nalso is generated, a sacred mountain, which the extraordinary abilities of Lama Ganchen as healer uh, allow to uh, recognize as ancestral sacred site. Yes, but we're scientists, right? So how do we translate this vision into a comprehensive set of ideas that we may transmit? Well, we have to transdisciplinary piece together many different sites, many different scientists, and to give them correlated assignments that all together become a complete body of work which tries to explain and follow up the work of how a healing site becomes a healing uh, natural network and a healing cultural network, a biosphere, an ethnosphere, on top of which a noosphere, that is the sphere of knowledge, is comprehended. So we have us, the chair, uh, me doing technomorphology of of sacred landscape, trying to analyze all elements that define a natural landscape, a sacred site. Then we have Giovanni Perotti, architect and geographer, who um, also helps uh, with the UNESCO institutional communication, uh, specified his work in the geography of healing and in the ethnography of local healing, of regional healing of every single forest. Tania Re, who is here with us today, is specialized on ethnomedicine and also on NALSO clinical studies. So she analyzes how is NALSO applied and what are the results and uh, how can this be translated into a, a, a scientific explainable, scientifically explainable success. Um, then on the um, NALSO uh, monastery group of Albaniano, we have Lama Caroline who studies archaeoastronomy and is specialized in mandala studies, among which especially the Kala Chakra uh, tradition. And then um, on the neurological aspect of, of healing and how NALSO is actually uh, demonstrating a, a neurological beneficial effects, uh, we are working with the Instituto Auxologico Italiano and the Univers University of Pavia through Amalia Di Moia and Riccardo Cremascoli. 
um, there is an archaeological aspect of healing sites that relates to monuments that have consider, been considered as, as um, ceremonial or sacred architecture. We started this work many, many years ago in the Andes and the Amazon, so we have a, a founded experience in world heritage sites such as Machu Picchu or Abiseo, and we work together with archaeologist Jose Bastante, who's a specialist in archaeologic archaeology and conservation of, of uh, lithic uh, monuments and ancestral sacred sites. Um, then uh, we uh, are very, very fortunate to um, combine the collaboration of Roger Hönderes and Elkana Vardenburg, who study NALSO in mind-body medicine for mental health. Um, we will later hear a small um, message by Roger, which was recorded today. He was with us today until very recently and sends his uh, best wishes for a successful Congress. Then Paola Muti, oncologist from the McMaster University, specialized in public health and cancer prevention. And then in Brazil, Jackson Rego Matos, um, studying environmental conservation uh, and deeply concerned about, of course, the state of the Amazon and how to um, uh, revert uh, the process of uh, reforestation into a, a restructuring of a healthy habitat. But let's quickly talk about why is the interdisciplinary research um, necessary in World Heritage Sites and Biosphere Reserve. Uh, let me quickly explain difference between a World Heritage Site and a Biosphere Reserve. World Heritage is essentially a site that expresses extraordinary and exceptional universal values, which are to be communicated to everybody since they are universal. And since these sites hold these exceptional values, they um, become a model and an example of knowledge which is literally embedded either into monuments or into natural sites. When you see a World Heritage Sites, you will often see this logo with a little round and square element, round meaning natural um, heritage, square meaning uh, cultural heritage, the togetherness of which becomes World Heritage. MAB, on the contrary, is the relationship between humans and the biosphere. So the relationship that we as humans activate and establish with the biospheres determines the wellness or the sickness of certain areas that become reserves for a successful development. While world heritage sites are very important for conserving um, a heritage as an asset that we have as humans, uh, biosphere reserves, can I see the second slide, please? Other slide. Next slide. Yes, um, well, World Heritage Sites are important for uh, the ability they hold to, to express the asset of a heritage. Uh, Biosphere Reserve are very important for uh, sustainable development, uh, meaning the ability to safeguard nature and culture uh, while developing an economy that has the ability to strengthen society. Uh, the next slide, please. The next slide. Uh, thank you. The objectives of our work in the area World Heritage Site of Sacramento di Gifa, where we are located, is first of all, generate a map of a sacred landscape, which once was Neolithic, then it was Celtic, Roman, Christian, now Buddhist. This is so interesting because each and every culture discovered by itself independently that this landscape had the ability to generate health, to generate harmony. It was an example, a living example of a biotic network able to teach us something. So a sacred landscape in this case translates as a forest where historical and archeological itineraries 
may be generated in order for everybody to appreciate this heritage. We're thinking, thanks to the work of, of um, Albaniano Center, to help in the, uh, in the building a Nalso route in the Biosphere Reserve to show how Nalso is so deeply connected to the regeneration of the environment. At the same time, a forest means medicinal plants. So we do need an ethnomedicine of European tradition to understand the ethnomedical map of a sacred site and the spiritual healing comparative study with Nalso. Why is Nalso being used everywhere in different geographies and how does it work? So right before COVID, we started our first work, which was a recognition process, a landscape survey at World Heritage Site uh, to identify a number of areas of refuges that were uh, clearly uh, belonging to Paleolithic times. And then we identified a number of, of areas that were connected to these Paleolithic uh, reserves into the Biosphere Reserve, which is now called Ticino Verbano. What is most striking of the Neolithic times is the amount of altars that give uh, right next to this temple, not more than five minutes away in a very beautiful walk in the woods, you will see a number of Neolithic altars that have been used to connect to nature, um, identify the order of the natural landscape. Uh, can I see the next slide, please? You see here the recognition of the site. The next slide, please. And these altars, the next one, please. The next again. You don't just see altars, you even have the uh, evidence of um, astronomical calendars. You see those, those square um, dark uh, cuts in the, in the lithic. Uh, surface uh, correspond to the possible study of shades and the way shades move allow people to identify the movement of celestial bodies, in particular the sun, uh, thereby defining a basic calendar. Uh, because of the position, the orientation and the connection with the lake, it is evidence that a very original um, uh, relationship with sacredness of origin of water and life was established in this area in connection to medicinal plants. Uh, the next slide, please. Um, next survey that was started again was identify the ceremonial paths that surround Gifa and enclose this temple into a greater sacred area that can be reconnected with a very old uh, methodology renewed for modern and contemporary times. But how does that translate into sustainable development? Next slide, please. Well, uh, we have analyzed what Nalso um, teaching and, and healing practices has been doing in, in the last uh, 40 years by the Tibetan lineage of Lama Ganchen. And, and we have found that at least four of the sustainable development goal, goals are implemented. So particularly number three, Tibetan medical and healing practices implemented in the World Heritage Site. And then four, education, so important, teaching and transmission of a traditional Tibetan knowledge. Then eight, a community-based improvement and development of a local economy. This uh, area, which was originally abandoned, is today a very flourishing village with at least 100 families that are giving back life to the forest. And then 15, environmental care and good practice to preserve the wood and the healing landscapes. So as a tradition of our chair, we decided to give a special play to um, uh, 
to thank um, Albaniano and the NALSO activity and most of all the tireless work of, of La Magancia and Rinpoche, um, uh, demonstrating how a very ancient lineage that crosses any possible discipline has a way and, and becomes a model uh, to identify a positive, sustainable development and reconnects the natural landscape with a culture that is ancestrally renewed to, through sacredness. So this was my little piece of the research. And now I, I pass the floor virtually to Roger Hunderers, who will give us a small video on his part on the NALSO research. Thank you very much. Dear Chairman, all participants, good evening or morning, wherever you are on the world. At this moment, I am in the sky between Italy and the Netherlands. I have to go back for a big conference, which I'm chairing myself uh, tomorrow morning. So I'm not able to participate uh, live in this event, but I uh, agreed to record this video to give you some insight of my own um, experiences with NALSO self-healing meditation practice. My name is Rogier Hungers. I'm a psychiatrist and I'm head of clinical affairs and head of research of the Center for Integrative Psychiatry of Lentes in the north of the Netherlands. I've been working in mental health care for about 23 years and the last years my interest is mainly on integrative medicine, on uh, meditation and spirituality. Together with my colleagues, I founded the Center for Integrative Psychiatry, where we combine Western psychiatry with lifestyle changes, meditation, and natural medicine, like herbs and supplements. In 2004, I met Lama Ganshan Rinpoche, and I was introduced to Nelson Tantric Self-Healing Practice. After this first experience, I traveled with Lama Ganshan around the world, and I've been um, witnessing the effects of his meditation practices, also experiencing myself for 16 years. The last 10 years, I've been practicing on a daily basis, and um, I have heard from many people a lot of positive experiences with meditation practice. Also for myself, it has been a blessing and has a positive effect on both body and mind. At the same time, as a scientist and a researcher, I like to try to see if we can research the effect in a scientific way, in a Western scientific way um, also. And so, Together with Palamuti and La Michelle Rinpoche, and also with Adin, Tania, Gabriela, Ricardo, many other people, we started this uh, research program, the NALSA Research Group, and we are preparing for different kind of research projects uh, to, to find out what are the effects of NALSA tantric self-healing uh, seen from Western science. And um, so we are, the, uh, preparing for doing randomized clinical trials. Uh, Paula Muti is a professor of uh, cancer research. She's speaking later today, and she is um, preparing for a trial to see what are the effects with, in women with breast cancer, looking at uh, genetic profiles and uh, blood tests, also uh, brain scans and many other kinds of way of assessing the effects. Myself, my main expertise is in mental health care. 
So I'm preparing a randomized clinical trial with patients with mental health problems and looking especially for questionnaires which are validated for this kind of research. To prepare for this randomized clinical trial, last year I've been guiding myself, a group, for as a pilot project to see if it's feasible to do this kind of work in mental health care. So I found uh, 15 mental health professionals, all of them with a lot of meditation experience, um, mostly mindfulness meditation. And they agreed to participate in uh, a three month period of pilot project where every two or three weeks we met as a group to do this practice together and also to give some explanation on many aspects of this practice. Meanwhile, in between the participants practice at home and they were using a video which was very kindly uh, prepared by Lama Michel de Boucher, um, guiding them to the practice and giving also some explanation. Every time when we met, we exchanged experiences. I gave some explanations and then we practiced together, always starting with nine rounds meditation breathing. And uh, in this way, it was very useful. So when we started, most of the participants were a little bit like uneasy and surprised to find that this kind of, this kind of practice is very different from uh, mindfulness meditation. If you look in, in the scientific literature, you can see that there are thousands of studies on mindfulness meditation, but only a few, maybe four or five, on Vajrayana practices, which is a different class of meditation. <clears throat> so um, we started and the first um, response were that some people felt some kind of resistance to do it as they felt it might give a lot of emotions to them <clears throat> and many of them thought it was a kind of strange practice they didn't understand the words the meaning and uh, others said <clears throat> immediately they felt more energy or more um, flow or love five of them said they felt a, a lot of clarity in their mind some of them felt nothing they, they questioned do, am i doing the right thing here they didn't notice anything a few, two of them thought it was too religious in a way, as there were images of Buddhas involved. Almost all of them were very grateful to participate and felt relaxed and inspired. Some people said that during the practice, they, were, they felt themselves being confronted with some emotional issues inside. And almost all of them felt more compassion. So uh, we have been... Um, using questionnaires on mental health disorders like anxiety, depression, sleeping disorders, stress, but also quality of life, resilience, and emotion regulation. And um, it was a bit of a disappointment that we could not find uh, a clear difference in pathology. That means we didn't really see a lot of a reduction of stress or anxiety or depression. On the other hand, it made sense because we were using happy, healthy people with no problem whatsoever, who are already very much experienced as meditators. So they had very low levels of pathology. So to get it significantly lower within three months would be kind of difficult. On the other hand, we did find some significant changes on general health, and also interestingly, on the aspect of blaming others or the outside world for your own problems. This was lowered significantly during the training. On average, the participants um, gave uh, 8.1 for, for the practice. And they said that it was most useful for them to be together and practice on a two weekly basis, to have a video explaining everything they could use at home and the explanation which was provided by me about the background of the practice and what we were doing about the words, the meaning, etc. So in summary, um, we found that this Nelson self-healing practice can be 
introduced in mental health care for workers, mental health care workers. Um, for those who have a very high level of health and well-being, we did not find any significant reduction of pathology, as it was already very low, but we did see an increase significantly of general health and the uh, tendency to blame others for problems in your life. Um, we, we found many, many positive experiences, like being more compassionate, more relaxed, more clarity, things like this. Some negative experiences, which means people felt sometimes they were getting more sensitive to influence from the outside world or like sensory input was more sensitive. And some of them felt more emotional or had went through some kind of uh, grief. Um, and, um, but that's mainly all. And um, um, taken all together, it seems like positive results in this kind of group. It would be important to do this again, but then with people who are suffering from mental health problems, because then we can really see if it will give a reduction of pathology. And uh, in this way, we are practicing and preparing for a randomized clinical trial, which we hope to do in the next year, and then to do this in a more um, stronger design, so to be more, uh, more confident of the results, of which I myself am already um, uh, convinced, but we have to see if we can find this in a, and we can show it in a scientific way. So I hope this was useful. Uh, this is my contribution. I uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to present this first small experiences and uh, wish you a very successful conference and hope to meet you soon. So thank you very much all the way to the airplane, taking Roger back to, to, Nether to the Netherlands. As, as you can see, although we have very different approaches, uh, the scientific methodology is one. Therefore, we are capable of defining uh, common hypothesis and working with a shared methodology, although we have very different professions. And I am now ready to share and give the floor to Dr. Tania Re, um, anthropology, medical anthropologist, uh, psychologist, uh, homeopath, and recently also airplane pilot, uh, who is uh, ready to talk um, to us about um, a recent work that has been activated on those who practice NALSO meditation. Hello, um, Tanya, it's a pleasure to see you alive and kicking on the other side of the internet. Uh, we just mm -hmm. recently coming back from a, a very, very significant expedition in the Amazon. So we both share a very, very strong jet lake but I see you're ready to speak. So I will hand you the floor. Thank you so much uh, for the introduction. Uh, please tell me just uh, if you can see my screen. Um, we can see it. Okay. I will ask the other participants if they do. Do the other participants see the screen? Okay, just to be sure that, uh, because uh, uh, I would say, okay, perfect. Um, so thank you for the introduction uh, and uh, thank you to Rohir, who is part of the, of the group uh, of the NALSO project. Um, my pres presentation will be short, uh, because I want to just to introduce you uh, part uh, of the uh, methodolo methodological approach uh, we, we want to, to use uh, for, uh, um, for doing uh, this research uh, on NALSO practice. So the idea uh, was to create uh, a questionnaire 
for the people who in the past uh, used the Dunanso um, technique uh, for, uh, for different uh, kind of disease. Uh, here I mentioned the cancer, uh, but uh, the, the group of patients and also uh, people uh, without a specific diagnosis uh, uh, beneficiate of the of, of now so so uh, the, the questionnaire is divided in three parts the, the first one uh, is related to the biographical uh, data so the name uh, uh, the surname uh, the country of residence because we have to uh, underline that uh, the, the NASA community is an international community so there are people from Europe but also for Asia uh, from uh, South America and uh, and also Africa uh, a contact uh, in order uh, to have a, a direct uh, uh, contact with uh, with the person uh, in order uh, to 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 develop uh, uh, the research, not just to have uh, um, general uh, data, but uh, some stories uh, that uh, we collected, and also the the, the group in Albaniano uh, had collected in the past. Um, the, the clinical story are very interesting and so we want also to uh, to know uh, after after years uh, because uh, there are people who uh, practice now so for uh, 10 years or 20 years uh, so it's interesting for example if a person had a cancer uh, 10 years ago uh, what happened in these 10 years uh, and what is going uh, now Okay, the, the, second, uh, the second part uh, is uh, uh, dedicated uh, to uh, the different kinds uh, of uh, healing uh, the person received. As uh, Professor Guerci mentioned before, uh, so the, um, the, the healing experience uh, is not just in the body, even if the Western world uh, uh, dedicated uh, a lot of attention uh, to healing uh, the, the body, but uh, we are not just the body, we are mind, body, and, uh, and spirit. Uh, so uh, the idea is to share with the person uh, through the questionnaire which kind of uh, the healing uh, was received by the person, so physics, mental, spiritual, or all the three. How have you received uh, healing? So direct uh, uh, from Lama Ganchen Rinpoche. So was a, uh, there were some experience very interesting uh, where the, the person was, uh, um, was healed uh, directly by Lama Ganchen or through the Nelson uh, techniques. So the idea is uh, to have these two uh, to um, to group uh, of uh, people uh, with uh, with different uh, healing uh, received uh, where so the importance uh, as uh, Adin uh, underlined uh, during uh, her speech uh, the importance uh, not uh, is not only in the healer so not only la maganchen not only the technique but also uh, the place uh, where uh, uh, the, the, the practice uh, were uh, were uh, were done uh, or uh, were received. So in Albaniano, in Borobudur, we will dedicate uh, uh, one day to Borobudur on Friday, or in another part of the world, uh, Lama Ganchen spread. Uh, um, his um, healing system and his practice uh, in all around the world. So there were some cases, uh, for example, uh, in Brazil uh, or in other countries. Um, also, we want, uh, we would like to know uh, to, um, the time. So how long the person uh, had been uh, used uh, the, the Nelson techniques? techniques, so more than 30 years, uh, between 30 and 10, uh, or less uh, than, than three, three years. 
uh, the frequency of the practice. Uh, uh, of course, uh, Lama Ganchen uh, um, underlined the importance of uh, doing this practice every day, like uh, meditation or mindfulness. Uh, it, it, it's important because uh, uh, if you want to train uh, your mind uh, and also your spirit, uh, it's important to, to train uh, every, every day. Uh, have you used uh, any other remedies? Uh, so this is related uh, to uh, this integrated uh, uh, medical integrated approach uh, that is uh, that 20 years ago was quite new in uh, in Europe, uh, and then now more and more uh, is, uh, is is not new but is uh, part of the. Uh, uh, of the of the possibility of the healing possibility that uh, uh, a person uh, has, um, so we 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 want uh, we would like to know uh, our focus is uh, on Tibetan medicine that is not just uh, uh, the the spiritual part uh, but uh, uh, there is um, um, uh, a long index of plants, uh, uh, very old remedies uh, that uh, have been used uh, by Tibetan monks uh, and uh, uh, a lot, uh, unfortunately, some of the plants uh, is not so easy uh, to, to have the opportunity to, to take uh, this kind of Tibetan uh, remedies, but uh, there are Tibetan uh, um, medical doctors, so we want to know if uh, uh, the, the healing process uh, uh, is just uh, the NALSO the NALSO approach, or there are Tibetan remedies, particularly plants, uh, or uh, other traditional Western medicine like surgery, radiotherapy, or chemotherapy, integrated medicine, and so phytotherapy, and so plants uh, not from Tibet but from Europe uh, or uh, South America homeopathy, homotoxicology, or, or both. Western medicine, uh, we say integrated, integrated medicine because more and more people, for example, uh, use chemotherapy to treat cancer, but at the same time, the same time, uh, they use also homeopathy or uh, other um, healing uh, remedies like uh, NALSO. Are there any medical records uh, uh, that uh, show the healing obtained? This is very important uh, because uh, um, the, the, the Western uh, medical approach uh, won't, uh, and also uh, it, even if we consider that uh, sometimes the Western approach uh, is, uh, is narrow, it's important uh, uh, to recognize uh, and to have the, the the proof that uh, the, the, the healing uh, was, uh, was real. And so using uh, um, scan or x-rays, uh, so the, the, the clinical data that support um, what, uh, uh, what the, the NALSO or NALSO plus other remedies uh, uh, have. Uh, can you write your healing experience, experience in narrative form? This is the, uh, the last question. So the question are, uh, we, don't, uh, we, we, we don't want to just uh, uh, the, 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 the objective data. We would like to, uh, to have also the narrative part. So narrative medicine is, uh, is not new. Uh, it is a very interesting approach, uh, and even if, uh, and also the, the, the Western uh, medicine open uh, to this uh, narrative medicine approach uh, in order to underline the importance uh, of, the sh of the subject uh, and uh, of, the, of the story uh, that uh, the, the people, um, uh, the person uh, has. So we, we have just uh, started uh, uh, with the questionnaire. Uh, the idea is to spread uh, all over the, the NALSO community. And uh, so the, 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 the work uh, is, uh, is, is going on. 
So thank you for, uh, for your attention. And uh, I give the floor again to, to Adina. Thank you very much, Tanya. Very, very beautiful synthesis of, of the wild work that you're carrying forward together with us in this very wide group of which you have seen just a tiny, whiny part. And I would like to ask maybe to Professor uh, Julieta Haider or Antonio Guerci and Nasiri Paolo Refice, do you would like to comment on something if you if if there is any special uh, you would like to contribute to in this round table? Hello, did you hear me? Does anybody hear me? I'm not sure I'm being heard by the Congress. Are you connected? Are we connected? Looks like we are. Hello. We are unmuted. And does the Congress hear me? If you could kindly unmute yourself. Um, well, if there are no more questions or comments, I would like to come to a closing. And I would like to remind to our Congress that as UNESCO chair, uh, we work to build in the minds of humans and not just humans, in the minds of men and women and everybody on the planet, uh, the idea of peace. Because since the wars start in the mind, it is in the mind of humans that we have to generate the walls of peace. And we have to literally build them, as does, say, the wall in the central building of UNESCO Paris recite, which corresponds to the first article of the convention creating UNESCO. And I myself was so specially surprised by the fact that one of the most powerful slogans, I would say, of Lama Ganjan work was that that inner peace is the most solid foundation for world peace. And I, I, I read this as a major teaching, as an example that UNESCO acknowledges and we as share will also like, we as chair will also like to share with everybody. So uh, I would then would like to, to thank the chairwoman Giulietta Haidar and Professor Orefice Guerci Siri, uh, Tania Re, uh, who are with us tonight, but most and foremost to Lama Michelle. Uh, abbot and teacher and mentor of a very powerful and meaningful community in Albagnano, who leading by example and by experience and by evidence more than by words, is literally changing and improving this world. And doing this in these times requires not just strength and awareness, but it does require a will which is not common and that we as UNESCO chair uh, desire to acknowledge and recognize. And, and thank you so very much for the unimaginable kindness of hosting us tonight in this so very beautiful temple and uh, study room as we may call it. I am sitting right behind the most wondrous sculpture uh, donated by Franco Ceccarelli, a very, very beautiful Tara I, I wish could be seen everywhere. And I think it will, because this is a World Congress. So uh, this beautiful piece of work will be evident in the eyes of, of many. So thank you so very much, Albaniano community. Um, Lama Michel Rinpoche. Uh, thank you, Lama Ganchen, for being here with us in a way that is not 
very easy to explain on a scientific level, but that we do all feel with our heart. And um, I would say we're ready to close and I give you an appointment for Friday when the session of the Congress will be fully concentrated on the work that NALSO started 30 years ago on the World Heritage Site of Borobudur and how this work has changed the monument, the conservation, the idea and the imagery itself of a very beautiful archeological site in Indonesia, in the island of Java. Thank you very much. Um, Julieta, maybe you want to close? Quizás quisiera cerrar? You would like, you should unmute yourself. No sabemos cómo decirle, Julieta, deberías quitarte, deberías... Okay, okay. Yeah, ah, ahora sí, ahora te escuchamos. Si no, hay, si no hay nadie más, entonces ahorita vamos a hacer unas preguntas de YouTube. Adine, puede ser, y tú traduce. Sí, está bien, sí hay preguntas, pero no las ser? he recibido hasta ahora. Tú has Yo recibido preguntas. Ahora para, porque, y a ver quién, quién responde, porque hay preguntas para Lama, Hay pregunta para comentario para Vitorio, para, perdón, Antonio, y para ti también. Entonces, hay algunas preguntas generales que podemos hacer y tú ves quién contesta. ¿Cómo será? Porque es, es bueno dar la, la, comentar y dialogar con, con, con YouTube, ¿no? Con, con el público. Entonces, si quieres, yo, yo paso las preguntas. ¿Ya? Sí, gracias, Julieta. Voy a leer. Ok, voy a leer. Ok, ok. Entonces, a ver. Eh, Una primera, un primer comentario es que eh, eh, hacían varios, felicitaron mucho eh, la mesa, que era muy importante el diálogo entre las culturas ancestrales, ¿no? Y fundamentalmente lo que planteó eh, Antonio, ¿no? Eh, la relación, eh, ese, ese, ese importante trabajo de investigación eh, que, se, que se plasma en el museo sobre las culturas ancestrales en relación a las medicinas. Eso es muy importante porque son de cinco continentes, como decía Antonio, como expuso del de museo, es un primer punto, ¿no? Que es un punto, Adin, que nos, nos gustaría comentar porque es, es un punto de diálogo entre las, las medicinas ancestrales en relación um, a lo que es Oriente, que implicaría tanto África, América Latina, Asia y todos los otros, en relación a la medicina occidental. Ese es un primer comentario importante que yo creo que el trabajo de usted está, está muy bonito. El otro, el otro comentario es el diálogo eh, que planteaba a partir de Lama, Lama el, el nombre, no me acuerdo del apellido, Riponti, como era así, de Lama, eh, que otro comentario era eh, cómo él podría explicar un poco más, si está ahí, el impacto de la meditación en el equilibrio mental y físico, ¿no? Y cómo es que esa meditación puede ser terapéutica y equilibrar las energías del cuerpo y de la mente, ¿no? Eso es lo que aporta Oriente, eso está en YouTube. Um, también para Antonio, también se felicita mucho todo su trabajo de, de excelencia. Y hay una pregunta muy interesante también de Francisco de, de Brasil, que, eh, que plantea eh, cómo es que, que lo, lo, ustedes, los expositores, a ver quién quiere contestar, puede, puede plantear la transreligiosidad. Es de Brasil. Eh, cómo hay, mm, mm, cómo cada religión eh, tiene un, eh, aporta un aspecto positivo, ¿no? un buen aspecto, para pensar eh, los principios eh, de, de cada uno, de, del pensamiento de cada religión. O sea, la pregunta en concreto es eh, ¿cómo podemos hablar, hablar entre tan, tantas religiones, tanta variedad de religión? ¿Cómo una trans... Porque la, la categoría de la transdisciplinaridad plantea la trans... Re, re, religio, re, oh, madre mía. Las trans religión. ¿Cómo sería el diálogo, por lo tanto, de, del Tibet con África, con otras, otras eh, religiones hinduistas, ¿no? 
Esa es la idea, esa, esa es la, primera, la pregunta que me parece importantísimo retomar, si ustedes pueden, ¿no? Eh, también, también algunas cosas que preguntaron también en el YouTube es eh, en relación a la terapia, si entendimos más o menos a la terapia que tú expusiste, Adin, de Nangarso, eh, porque son muchas terapias, pues, una terapia que entendimos tibetana, que preguntamos si esa terapia, yo tengo que, creo que está, tiene varios principios, y, y si la base es solo la meditación o las plantas, no entendimos bien, no entendimos bien la terapia, ¿qué cubre la terapia? Esos serían los comentarios generales. Adiós. A mil gracias, Julieta. Creo que sería mejor la mamá Michelle para contestar a esas dos y media preguntas. Si la mamá Michelle quiere venir, uh, um, se refiere. ¿Crees que te hago un resumen? No, oh, no es necesario. Ok, uh, muchas gracias. Yo, visto que antes hablé en inglés, creo que tal vez mejor que continúe contestando las mismas preguntas también en inglés. Ok. So, uh, the first question was about meditation and the relationship between the healing of body and mind in meditation technique. Ok. Uh, making it short, uh, what most of us nowadays know as meditation is learning how to enter into the meditative state. Basically is learning how to be able to concentrate one's own mind into one specific object and be present at the present moment, which is very much connected to what is known as mindfulness and so on. And in relation to that, what happens is that for me is like Okay, first we need to learn how to drive, then we can choose where we want to go. So learning how to meditate and being able to have this awareness of one's own mind is basically this presence of one's own mind in the present. It's like learning how to drive. Then from that, there are many, many different states of mind and consciousness and qualities that we can develop, like meditation, To, on love, on wisdom, on generosity, on many different aspects. It's very important to remember that when we say the word meditation, the word in the Tibetan tradition is gom. Gom literally means familiarization. So it's not a method, method of reflection upon, upon the meaning of something. It's more a method to induce oneself into certain states of consciousness in order to familiarize oneself with it. The relationship that is there between body and mind, actually, it's something inevitable because body and mind are always together. It's not possible to do something in the mind that doesn't have an effect on the body. It's not possible to do something in the body that do not have an effect on the mind. They, are, they go directly together. But the techniques of non-centric self-healing meditation and the other practices of meditation in Buddhism, and we have many different practices that have an intense of healing, are not there to substitute the doctor or the traditional methods of healing. Still, if we are sick, we go to the doctor. And according to what is the medicine system that fits us the best, and according to the needs that we have, where we find ourselves in the world, and so on. So since in Tibet, a practitioner of meditation, if we would have get sick, sure, his meditation practices and there are different healing practices that will help, but still he would go to the doctor. So there he would use Tibetan medicine and according to where we are, the techniques of medicines that we have and so on. So the healing is related to most of all an inner healing on a psychological level, emotional, on an energetic level also that has a very strong impact in the rest of the whole body also. So it's not that the meditation technique doesn't have an effect on our physical health, it does, but it's not a method to substitute a normal traditional method of healing. So uh, this is one point which is important. No? And the relationship between body and mind is there from the way the, how we sit 
to the different ways through the visualizations, how uh, we direct our own subtle energy and so on. It's very much connected within body and mind in these meditations, okay? But it's again, something that it's possible to explain in very much detail and long, but it's something that we need to experience most of all. And uh, as meditation is a mental state, which uh, it's not so common for us to experience. And uh, it brings actually a lot of well-being, both of mind, but also of body. And uh, many of the modern studies have focused a lot on the physical effects of meditation. And uh, so this is one of the other proofs, let's say, that body and mind always goes together in any meditational practice. Regarding the Nalso system, Nalso is a very comprehensive word as a system. Inside of it, there are different meditation techniques. There is the whole part of the same lineage and tradition which regard uh, medicinal, Tibetan medicine tradition. There is the whole parts of herbs. There is the part of the treatments and so on. So when we were before in different moments talking about Nalso, it's a very wide context, context. It's not something, it's not like one specific technique. There is one specific meditation, which is very often called Nalso meditation, which is the meditation which Lama Ganshin called Nalso tantric self-healing, which is a meditation focused mainly on the healing of body and mind from a subtle perspective. Again, it's not there to substitute medicine. Then within the same world of this Nalso tradition, there is the whole part of healing which is connected from the ancient Tibetan medicine tradition, which is also part of it connected. So this doesn't mean that someone practicing Nalso meditation is studying Tibetan medicine or applying Tibetan medicine, but there are different parts of the knowledge and experience that come from the tradition of Tibetan medicine, which is very much connected with the Tibetan Buddhist tradition. And then this is also present within the Nalso tradition. Regarding the third question, which was about the trans-religious, you know, instead of transdisciplinary, trans-religious, I believe personally, like my experience together with Lama Ganji Rinpoche was that he was extremely open to every form of religion and tradition in every aspect, at every moment, in every context, and I saw very many, many times people coming to him and said, oh, Rinpoche, oh, what do you think if I go to see that master or I go to that temple or I go to that tradition? And, I, and he ever, always answered in the same way. You go. What is of benefit, you take. What is of no benefit, you leave. So there has never been an attitude within it of saying, okay, no, this is your own tradition. You cannot touch others. You cannot listen to others. Instead, it's very important to learn and listen from all different traditions because very often when we are together and when we find ourselves confronted with a different tradition, it helps us to have a more clear view of our own even. So on the other side, all the different spiritual traditions that I have seen up to now, it's there, most of the times they are very complex and complete system. So I don't see very much the benefits of making a sort of soup where we put everything together into one and try to make a new taste out of it. Most probably will have indigestion if we put everything together into the same plate. So that's why, as I said in the speech before, we should respect all traditions deeply and we should follow with the determination the one we prefer, but at the same time being open to learn from everyone. We shouldn't be closed. I believe that it's, we are, it's much more important for us to meet those that are different than meeting those that are similar. Because it's by meeting those that are different that we learn, that we confront ourselves with the differences and uh, with our own view, actually. So I don't, I have no so much knowledge about any particular context in which there is a mixture of all these different religious, spiritual traditions. Uh, Lama Ganshi Rinpoche put a lot of effort for many years in what he called the importance of a spiritual forum within the United Nations, which is the importance for 
common ground where all the different spiritual traditions and religious traditions can meet and talk and discuss about our well about the welfare of humanity basically you know of the planet and help and to support also the united nations in that sense but uh, it has always been the idea of different traditions meeting together to discuss and bring the best of each one for the well-being of everyone but not the idea of mixing all together and making one result out of the mixing of many different traditions so this personally i think yes we should respect all we should learn all we should listen and so on but we should understand that every tradition has its own coherence its own system and it's important to be respected okay i think these were the three questions right so thank you very much okay. yes, Julieta, espero yeah. que... ¿Sí? ¿Me escuchas? Sí. Sí, espero que eso haya resuelto las inquietudes de YouTube. Uh -huh. Sí. Sí. Y Entonces... Ahora, si tú quieres cerrar, después yo cero también. Uh -huh. Si tú quieres eh, despedir, yo también des... después me despido. Adiós. Despido y dejo a ti las palabras finales. Entonces... Sí. Hoy agradeciendo eh, el público que nos ha seguido hasta ahora, eh, los ponentes que han dado lo mejor de sí, tratando de um, conjugar y, y, y resumir en pocas palabras y en poco tiempo una, una experiencia realmente transdisciplinaria que se manifiesta en la realidad y se transforma en un trabajo común. Por un lado, en la investigación científica, pero más que todo, sobre todo, en la experiencia espiritual, en el linaje. So, I would like to close this meeting thanking all the, all the speakers, the public, and the group of scientists who work together to making, trying to make sense to uh, this transdisciplinary body of knowledge but most of all to the practitioners who make of NALSO a true experience which exists here and now to transform and improve lives. So thank you very much from the uh, center of Albaniano and I pass back the floor to Professor Julieta Haider for the closing of the day. Thank you very much. Okay. Um... En el tercer Congreso Mundial de Transdisciplinariedad, agradece la, la presencia de, 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 de la Semana de Ida Indonesia Italia, ¿no? los participantes de hoy. Y eh, para nosotros, para el Congreso, es muy importante, relacionando las sesiones que hemos tenido, ¿no? casi un año de sesiones, eh, tenemos eh, casi 12 meses de Congreso grabado en la página web. Y lo que expusieron hoy, eh, a, de, de, a partir de dos puntos. Primero, eh, la, con el doctor Antonio Guerci, la, las medicinas ancestrales, que me parece, parece muy importante en términos de que el diálogo, ¿no? El diálogo de la transculturalidad en relación a las terapias y a, y a, la, a la sanación y a la curación, esa, esa propuesta que, que de, de la investigación que tiene el doctor Antonio Guerci, que, que a partir del de, de otro uh, investigador Scarpa, es, establece y abre un camino de diálogo muy importante de respeto en relación a las medicinas tradicionales. Porque hay países que, que dicen que son, como todos saben, que dicen que son brujos, ¿no? Son brujos, son chamanes y son fuera de, de la legalidad. Y eso hay que, que rescatar. Entonces, yo creo que es importantísimo la memoria de la cultura en relación a las, a las medicinas eh, ancestrales que plantearon hoy en esa exposición. Por otro lado, la terapia de Ngarso, Ngarso no sé cómo, cómo se pronuncia, me perdone, de Albanan, Albaniano, bueno, me perdone la, la pronunciación, eh, la, la experiencia de ustedes nos, nos parece también dentro de del macro campo de las medicinas ancestrales, la experiencia de ustedes, de Nangalso, que es la tradición tibetana, ¿no? Según entendí, 
e albanano, que tem várias terapias que vocês trabalham, é, que implica vários tipos de, como eu disse, Lama Michel, é, que implicaria várias dimensões, implicaria, por isso, Adine, implicaria a transdimensionalidade de muitos níveis da realidade. E, nesse sentido, as terapias de Tibete, essas terapias que, que se trabalha de Oriente, de Ásia, creio que é, é importante porque cruzam vários níveis de la curação, não? vários níveis da terapia, para, como eu disse, Lama Michel, desde o psíquico, o, o psicológico, o mental, o físico, o emocional, são várias dimensões, é transdimensional, e nesse sentido se articula um diálogo com a transdisciplinaridade. Por outro lado, quando contestou as perguntas de Francisco Lemos, de Brasil, era a categoria de transreligião, ou transreligiosidade, transreligião que implicaria o diálogo, e, e Lama Michel eh, contestou, é um diálogo e respeito entre todas as religiões, mas creio que, também como disse ele, o diálogo implica compreender e respeitar. Não implicaria juntar todo, porque é muito complexo, não? É muito complexa as religiões, são muito complexas. Todas as religiões ancestrais têm uma complexidade impressionante. É um grupo de divinidades impressionante, não? No Tibet, na Índia, em, to, em África, em todos os países, na cultura ancestral, por exemplo, da Mesoamérica, de los Andes. E creio que o importante é respeitar, em termos de uma trans, trans religião, respeitar a alteridade, respeitar a diferença e, por tanto, estabelecer um diálogo. E, nesse sentido, e compreender, mas, não, como disse Lama Michel, não, é impossível juntar tudo. É muito, muito, muito difícil. Muito difícil porque é muito variado e muito diverso. Agradecemos muito a sua colaboração, a de todos, a DIN e sua organização, e nos vemos, então, no viernes, para seguir com esse diálogo. Muitíssimas graças. Adeus. Muitas graças. Hasta o viernes. Adeus. Adeus. Tchau.